On this episode of Urban U, the story of a World War II Jewish commando unit as told in a new book written by a Hunter College professor. A student from the CUNY School of Professional Studies determined to help diversify museums so that younger generations can see themselves represented when they visit. And the City College alum who founded a quintessential New York rock band. That and much more. Welcome to Urban U. But Warren, if you heard of us, you probably heard we ain't in the prisoner taking business. We in the killing Nazi business. And cousin, business is a booming. <laughs> Most people know that a few years back, director Quentin Tarantino directed a film called *Inglorious Bastards about a group of Jewish soldiers behind enemy lines in Nazi Germany. But in her new book, Hunter Professor Dr. Leah Garrett tells an even more interesting story of the real life Jewish commandos called X Troop. X Troop was a top secret commando unit that was created by Churchill and Lord Mountbatten in 1942 when the war was going really bad for the British. And they decided they had to do something pretty extreme and unusual. To help turn the war around, they came up with the idea of forming an elite commando unit made up of Jewish refugees. These guys would have so many qualities that would be important to the British military. There would be German speakers, they would be absolutely focused on the cause of ridding the world of Nazism. They selected very educated and very physical young men and decided that the training would be the most extensive and thorough in the entire British military. The ex-troopers were trained to be both fighting warriors and skilled counterintelligence officers. Quickly, the British military realized that these guys were extraordinary. And then they made another decision about these men, that it's too dangerous if we have them fight as their own troop. Because if there's a roadside bomb, we, we will lose all these guys. So right before D-Day, the British military decided we're not going to actually let them fight as their own unit. We're going to parcel them out and have them be the leaders of these other commando units. All of the men of X Troop were exceptional, but George Lane was one of the bravest. He was constantly volunteering to be sent behind enemy lines. In the lead up to D-Day, he was captured while on one of those secret missions. They bring him to this beautiful sort of castle and he's looking out the side of his blindfold and he memorizes exactly what it looks like. And they bring him into a room and they say to him, clean yourself up, you're gonna meet someone important. They lead him into this grand study and it's Field Marshal Rommel himself. They discuss their thoughts on the war and Lane somehow charms Rommel. Although worried that he would be killed soon after, Lane is sent to a nearby POW camp where he tells one of the British commanding officers, I think I know the location of Rommel's headquarters. One of the guys who's standing there says, I know that building because there's a library in the prisoner of war camp. He runs to the library, he brings back a book, he says, is it this building? He said, yeah, that's, that's where I had this interview with Rommel. They send it back through wire transmission to London. And just a couple weeks later, Rommel's driving in his car into the headquarters. Bombs land all around him, and he's injured so deeply he's pulled out of the war. Another ex-trooper of note was Lieutenant Manfred Gans. Manfred Gans was one of the most interesting and compelling stories I wrote about in, in a book packed with compelling and interesting stories. In the final days of the war, he goes to his commanding officer and says, I need a Jeep because I've got to go get my parents out of Terrazinstadt concentration camp. And his commanding officer is like, no, the war is still on, you can't do that. And they, then he thinks, wait, this is Manfred Gans, right? So they give him a Jeep. They give him a driver, they give him a bunch of petrol, and he has this mission. They drive straight through Germany, goes across the Russian lines, goes across the American lines. Eventually, he gets to Terrazinstadt concentration camp, and the Russians have only, like, hours before gotten to the camp. He goes to the central office because the Nazis are so sick that they keep trying brutal track of every person who moves through these camps. And there's a young Jewish woman there and he says, I'm trying to find my parents and Moritz and Elsa Gans. And she looks through her big roster and then she just bursts into tears. And she said, you're never gonna believe this. I've actually found them. They're still alive. Some people have called uh, X Troop the real life inglorious bastards. 
Do you agree with that? When that movie came out, there were still a number of ex-troopers alive and they were furious and deeply hurt by it because what they said was they were never bent on revenge. They followed the rules of war to a T. As they always said over and over again, we are different from the Germans. We don't do things the way they do it. We do it in a better way. Why do you think that X Troop was so successful? I think X Troop was so successful because it was so personal that these guys knew that every day that passed was a day potentially some family member in hiding wherever they were would be captured. So they were so focused on winning and I believe 100% writing this book that these guys were central to the Allied success and that they really did do this thing they needed to do, which was beat the Nazis. From Hunter College, I'm Scott Kirby for Urban U. The CUNY system has a number of great film programs that let aspiring filmmakers follow their dreams. Urban U found one filmmaker from Brooklyn College whose short film, Catch Up, is just one gem to come out of these programs. Two, three. I think that the way kids experience time is overlooked. <laughs> Even little things that you don't think a kid would pick up on or understand, they are experiencing it as well in their own way. And that's kind of what I wanted this movie to be about, is just how kids <laughs> experience things and pass time. How time passes through a kid's eyes, because it's slow. It's super slow, and it doesn't make sense when people don't explain things to you, so you kind of make your own conclusions about things. Kids are interesting. Kids are interesting, and if we just paid attention to them a little more, they'd have, I think they have a lot to say, and a lot of insight on situations like being foreclosed on. Haley's short film fits in with a trend in films like Nomadland and books like Evicted, stories about families who are struggling with economic upheaval. I kind of just wanted to hone in on that um, feeling of being a kid and your parents are working nine to five or longer in most cases, I would say these days. The story isn't about the parents. It's about something that's happening to the parents, sure. But the kids at school are with her friends majority of the time. So I wanted to kind of showcase that. Here, Junie, do you want my fruit snacks? Ketchup, what is now ketchup, was the only idea that I had that stemmed from my own life. Who's gonna take care of Junie? I mean, this is insane. Ketchup tells a story of a family going through foreclosure through the eyes of the main character, June. I wanted to say what happened to me as a kid and kind of get that therapeutic aspect out of it, writing it however many years later. But I also wanted to have it be a, a, an enjoyable story and a movie to watch. So I made your lunch, it's in the fridge, it's bologna again. I'm sorry, I just haven't had time to get to the store. I actually filmed it in the house that my dad grew up in, which was in Princeton, New Jersey. And he, my uncle, my dad's twin brother, played Michael, the dad. So it hit very close to home on all fronts. Don't tell mom. Who likes baloney anyway? <laughs> As a young girl, June's perspective is vital to the film's story. It was definitely 100% intentional to juxtapose adult life and innocent kid life. I mean, it hits you like a brick <laughs> when something like that happens. I would say that ketchup in all the film is probably about like 80 to 85% true um, from taken from my own life directly. Haley has made three short films and worked on a music video, but the crew on Ketchup was unique in one very distinct way. My entire crew was all female from pre-production to post-production. It was entirely made by women, uh, which I felt really proud about. I've never felt more supported on set in my entire life. I've never felt more heard. It was just like being comfortable to turn around and have a conversation and open dialogue with everybody about whatever their job was and just be honest and, and we could just really get things done. I've never um, been in an environment like that. And as for the title? I actually just love ketchup. <laughs> as a kid, I've loved ketchup. My favorite condiment by far. 
For Urban U, I'm Craig Thompson. I'm so excited today to have welcome uh, Rita Moreno and Tony Kushner to El Centro Archives here at Hunter College in East Harlem in El Barrio. I had the chance to meet them when they were filming West Side Story. I told them they had to come look at this amazing collection that we have here. Tony Kushner used the collections from El Centro uh, for the material to get the script ready for West Side Story. Uh, and they came today, they visited. Uh, we showed them some materials related to her life. As a Puerto Rican historian, so proud of the history of the Puerto Rican community to have Rita Moreno to be here and also for her to validate this great collection that we have here, which is open to the entire community, to researchers. A very, very special emotional day for me. I am very, very proud. In the last decade, we've had nine of the hottest years in human history. So scientists are deadly serious about doing something to stop global warming. Some of their ideas verge a little bit on the science fiction. Like what if you could reduce the warming on Earth by using mirrors to reflect some of the sun's rays back into space? CUNY professor Peter Groffman is part of the Climate Intervention Biology Working Group. They are scientists from around the country looking at the question. There have been ideas um, of using mirrors, and particularly to put giant mirrors in space to reflect the sun's energy back to space, which is very appealing uh, to mi mirror manufacturers, but, but is not super uh, realistic. The origin of the idea comes from studying volcanic eruptions. They shoot tremendous amounts of these tiny sulfur aerosols into the stratosphere, and you inject those into the atmosphere, and they're like tiny, tiny, tiny mirrors that reflect the sun's rays back to space, and they cool the climate. This famously happened in 1815 when Mount Tambora in Indonesia erupted, causing 1816 to be the year without a summer, ruining crops in Europe and North America and causing snow in New England in June. More recently, in 1991, there was a big volcanic eruption and the rate of global warming slowed quite a bit. That was Mount Pinatubo in the Philippines. And so there's this idea, and so scientists said, well, if volcanoes can do it, maybe we can do it. We can do the same thing. So there's the idea that we can load airplanes up with sulfate aerosols, just like the ones that come out of volcanoes, fly up into the stratosphere and add a layer of sulfate aerosols to reflect energy back to space. What would be the potential downside of throwing this sulfate aerosol up into the high atmosphere? In the US and in, and in Europe, over the last 50 years or so, we've spent a lot of time struggling with acid rain which is caused by sulfur. Sulfur, we admit we burn coal and, and there's sulfur in the coal and it goes into the atmosphere. So a lot of people are like, we just spent 50 years getting the sulfur out of the atmosphere, you're gonna put it back now? Uh, and there's been some good analysis of that, that the amount of sulfur that they're talking about is, is really not enough to cause us a, 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 an acid rain problem. Another possible downside is an increase in ultraviolet radiation that may worsen problems like skin cancer and the sulfate aerosol particles make it kind of a hazy day, so we get more diffuse sunlight. It allows more ultraviolet radiation, damaging ultraviolet radiation through. So there's concerns about that. Professor Groffman says before we consider reflecting the sun back, we need to remember that the main cause of global warming, the carbon and gases we've put into our atmosphere, causing a greenhouse roof effect that holds in heat, is not just happening on summer days. So nighttime temperatures have risen much more than uh, daytime temperatures. And winter temperatures have risen much more than summer temperatures. And a lot of the ecological effects of climate change are coming from the change in the winter and the change at night. And solar radiation management doesn't do anything about that. Professor Groffman says it would be a big mistake to reflect the sun back without also reducing carbon in the atmosphere. One reason? If we cool temperatures, trees will not grab and store and protect us from as much of the carbon as they currently do, which could shoot warming right back up. 
and trees could hold less moisture, increasing floods. Also, it could change whole ecosystems, with animal species showing up where they've never been before, bringing destruction and disease. From a straight scientific point of view, that the uncertainties and the possible downsides, I would argue, are, are too high that we should not go down this route. The scientific consensus overwhelmingly is we, is we should solve the cause of the problem. We should get the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. We should stop emitting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And we're going down that road. I'm an optimistic person. I think in 2050, this discussion is going to be very, very different. And our economy is going to be decarbonized. And we're going to be well on the way to healing our atmosphere and healing our planet. I'm Donna Hanover for Urban U. Still up on Urban U, Velvet Underground the seminal rock band and their latest tribute to the recently departed founding member, City College alum, Serling Morrison. Stay tuned. My name is Nissan Ak. I'm studying orchestral conducting, master's degree in Queens College, and I want to be a conductor. I'm from Turkey, Istanbul. I want to combine traditional and modern music in a certain way that both audience and the players and me as a conductor will love it. I want to conduct in Carnegie Hall. As a woman conductor, we have a really few role models because it's a male dominant job and both the conductors and the players, they don't know what, how to react, actually. <laughs> Some of the people overcome it by starting acting masculine. I, I don't do that. I'm not masculine at all. I'm very modern and feminine, and I want to be a conductor. Maybe I'll be that role model for next generation. Lisa D.S. Lewis's story is one of accomplishment and aspiration. The Brooklyn native is a recent graduate of CUNY's Museum Studies program, and she has her sights set on bringing more color to mainstream museums. I've always been very much into arts and going on school trips. Uh, part of the New York City public school system, you tend to go to the same museums over and over. I grew up here in Brooklyn, so they often brought us to the Brooklyn Museum. I feel free when I'm in a museum. I feel that I'm surrounded by art. I'm surrounded by different stories. I am surrounded by a quiet place where I can think and collect myself. It's the feeling she wants other people of color to experience when they enter any museum. My goal is to make museums accessible to minorities, women of color, people of color, um, because they have been for so long, for centuries, misrepresented in museums. There's been a whitewashing of museums, of the stories, of the narratives, and our communities don't feel that they're represented there. I want our people to feel that they don't just have to go to a African-American museum, the Spanish museum, El Barrio, just to see their store, their narratives there. I want it to be the norm. Diaz Lewis got to work on her goal when she enrolled in CUNY's Museum Studies master's degree program as part of the very first graduating class. You had access to the executive staff at the New York Historical Society who were teaching the courses. And you were getting a behind the scenes understanding of all the different departments because museum studies goes beyond curation. And her interests go beyond museums. Advocacy and education have been a distinct part of her identity, which she attributes to her West Indian upbringing in Brooklyn. So you've worked in the foster care system and the shelter system. How has that shaped the way you feel about museums? You get an understanding of how people are accustomed to being treated as a number, how people are accustomed to not knowing that there are avenues for them to have access to things that they want to do. Part of what I believe museums should be doing is reaching out to the communities that they are in 
um, to encourage them to come within as opposed to focusing on the objects that are within the walls of the museum. She was able to lend her knowledge around such issues for the New York Historical Society's new exhibit titled Art for Change. And what that's looking at is homelessness in New York City actually focused around the 70s. There was an artist and homeless collaborative that was happening at the Park Avenue Armory. And artists would go into the women's shelter at the Armory and they would give them different art projects that they can collaborate on. It would help to boost their morale. It would help them to not feel the blank walls of being in a shelter. As she continues to look for work within the field, she remains optimistic about her ability to cultivate her love for art and advocacy. I will be fulfilling a lifelong dream of service and arts and meshing the two. It will be great for me, but it will be so much bigger than me. This is something that can change people's lives and bring color to their world where things often are very gray. Abby Ashola for Urban U. This is a song the three of us wrote for our friend Sterling Morrison, and it's called Last Night I Said Goodbye to My Friend. That is Lou Reed, John Cale, and Maureen Tucker of the Velvet Underground, the seminal rock band who, upon their introduction into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame here, chose not to play just an old song from their catalog, but a newly written tribute to their recently departed founding member and City College alum, Sterling Morrison. The Velvet Underground was one of the most influential bands in history. In an era of music often remembered for hippie flower power, the Velvet Underground was an icon of an entirely different counterculture. Part avant-garde art under the auspices of Andy Warhol, part expose of gritty urban life, part proto-punk experimentalism, part rock and roll, the joke was that they never sold many records, but everyone who bought one started a band. And Sterling Morrison was the lead guitarist. Born on Long Island, Morrison may have seemed more destined for academia than rock and roll. With time spent briefly at the University of Illinois, then City College, then Syracuse University, then City College again. Morrison had met Lou Reed at Syracuse in 1961. And after losing their first drummer, it was Morrison who rounded out the band's classic lineup by recruiting a high school friend's younger sister, Maureen Tucker, on percussion. By 1965, the Velvet Underground was born. Of course, a touring band doesn't leave a whole lot of time for studies, and Morrison's degree had been put on hold since 1965. But five years later, with a long summer residency in New York City, playing at the legendary Max's Kansas City, Morrison was finally able to return to City College and finish his English degree in 1970. Over the course of only a few years, though, tensions in the band would lead to the departure of Cale in 1968, Reed in 1970, and Morrison too in 1971, the last founding member to leave. In an ironic twist, for all the stops and starts to his schooling, it was indeed academia which ultimately tore him away from the band. While the band was touring in Texas, Morrison was accepted into a graduate program at the University of Texas, and he decided to stay. He would eventually earn a PhD in medieval literature. After leaving the band, Morrison, for the most part, stayed out of the music industry spotlight, indeed, even becoming a tugboat captain in Houston. Sadly, Morrison died of cancer in 1995 at the age of 53, a mere five months before the Velvet Underground was inducted into the Hall of Fame. But in his death, Sterling Morrison would bring the band together one last time, to this date, the last performance of the Velvet Underground. Last night, I said goodbye to my friend. For the record, 
I'm Ari Goldberg. Here we go. Texas. We leave you with more from the Queens College music student who is honing her skills of becoming a woman conductor. Until next time, thanks for watching these stories from the nation's largest urban university, the City University of New York. <laughs> <laughs>